to talk about something interesting. Well, it should come as no surprise that I underestimated the copyright situation and the systems we have in place right now for distributing a critical transformative work such as this are uh, somewhat lacking if you are the person creating the content. However, I don't mean to carry on or complain and certainly not to you guys. So let's just keep going and then realize that maybe at some point in the future I may have to put these up with a black screen over top of them. Also a bit of apologies, uh, video games got real wild in this quarantine life and that's where I've been. But now we should be good to go, there is a lot to talk about. Let's hit some uh, mistakes, omissions, and corrections from the previous episode. One that I kind of glanced over and I'm really actually very sorry for was the comment that Madoka's mom doesn't have OCD. I know there are a number of reasons why somebody would number their makeup and including just, you know, needing a bit of extra structure. I certainly didn't mean to equate that type of behavior to any type of mental disorder. And I realized kind of while I was saying it that it was kind of a throwaway comment out of ignorance. I do still think that the numbered makeup is a bit of an exaggeration and hyperbole, but it's mostly just to show Madoka's mom as um, ordered and structured. Another thing that I claimed kind of authoritatively that may or may not actually be true is that the story takes place in 2011. While the 2011 does appear on that title card in the runes, and using the phases of the moon throughout the show and Homer's calendar, it could absolutely occur in 2011. The show doesn't necessarily have to, as the 2011 in the title card could just be referring to the date that this was created. And of course, the specific alignment of the dates and phases of the moon come up in other years as well. While I don't think this changes my preferred reading as the events of the story happening in 2011, it's certainly possible that it's a little more ambiguous than what I claimed before. That actually leads very nicely into the topic of, you know, the technology and the differences of the setting of Madoka Magica compared to our world in 2011. For example, we see DDR machines, right? We see cars that are similar to the cars we know and use. But then we also see these absurd architecture structures or these bits of high-tech technology that really don't fit with what 2011 was like, as far as I remember it. I suppose it begs the question on whether or not Madoka's world was changed because of the introduction of magical girls in Kyubei's race. I mean, Kyubei makes it pretty clear when talking to Madoka that even something like the introduction of fire is directly related to the human's relationship with the incubator race. And we see other magical girls throughout different points in human history that we can kind of identify as having actually happened. So it's kind of not not an entirely alternate universe. Instead, what I'd rather look at is something that was brought up to me and something that I'd wanted to consider when we talked about the Witch's Labyrinth. That time and place, even in that first level of intradiegetic activity, are very light and very, well, for lack of a better word, let's say wishy-washy. This, I think, is pretty directly transferable from something like Revolutionary Girl Utna, where Otri Academy is not a place whatsoever, nor is it intended to be a place, just a state of mind that you're stuck in. I mean, Mitakihara City has a name, and Madoka's house has a consistent structure that appears again and again. In those ways, yeah, it's kind of unlike the Witch's Labyrinth, but in so many other ways, the setting is completely impractical and untrue to life. For example, shots of all these windmills here, or take this procession of pipes in the Sayaka and Kyoko fight. And yeah, totally, I think this is something that deserves a lot more attention, and we'll definitely talk to a bit more when it comes up, but the Discord user somehow kind of got there first and hit the nail on the head that this postmodern architecture, if you want to call it that, I'd call it a little more surreal, but it's a trademark of Shinbo's style, and he definitely used it in Monogatari, and used it for a purpose to reinforce the um, subjectivity of the story. I think there's a lot to say about the Monogatari franchise and its relationship to Madoka Magica, and I think a lot of that relies on a Shaft and its production schedules and um, inner workings during that time period, but also on the fact that Bakemonogatari aired before Madoka Magica, and Madoka Magica is an original anime, whereas Baki Monogatari and the rest of the Monogatari franchise is most certainly not. I'd certainly like to go into a little more depth here, and perhaps that's better suited to somebody who better understands the appeal of the Monogatari franchise. On YouTube, user Caffeine left a very in-depth comment um, that you should all go read about generally who was working on what and, you know, more specifics about the production than I am aware of or privy to. 
but I will at least give you my take. I have said in the last episode that I appreciate clarity, I appreciate conciseness, I appreciate the way Madoka Magica is written as an effective and focused tale. I do not think that Bakimonogatari shares any of those types of values, or even tries to attempt to share any of those. In fact, the third episode of Bakimonogatari is one character thanking another character for literally the entire duration of the episode. Nothing else happens. While I think that, yeah, you can tell a really engaging character story, and Monogatari does, I think that stuff like the abstract architecture and really cool visuals of the show are less effective overall than when it's used in something like Madoka Magica. Even if things like the architecture style is assumed or taken from Baki Monogatari, I can still tell you why and for what purpose it's used in Madoka Magica. Whereas for Monogatari and what I've seen of it, it seems to be a little more um, interesting for being interesting's sake. And I guess that goes along with the show's more um, verbose dialogue choices and languid series pacing, but uh, I think highlighting things that don't necessarily have a purpose is bad storytelling. And that's why I don't like the Monogatari franchise. Although I'd always be happy to revisit it, I think a lot of the issues that I have with it could be resolved with a really good dub localization. And yeah, if there's interest, I could certainly do a negative reading on something I don't enjoy. Talk about where I think some beloved property fails. In a lot of ways, I think those readings are just as much, if not more, valuable than um, positive ones. I think after season eight of Game of Thrones that maybe people are a little more open to that type of poignant negative criticism. And yeah, if there's more interest in talking about Shinbo as a career and his choices, then we can go back and check out the time the camera zooms into that one eye in Metal Fighter Miku versus what it means in Madoka when it happens. But I actually think that's one of the more covered topics in the anime landscape, and you don't need to look too hard to find somebody talking about just that. To get back on track, I think there's certainly a parallel between the Witch's Labyrinth and what we see from the real world. We certainly spoke a lot to it in the last episode. Madoka Magica is not literally intended to be our world. It's a facsimile or a play or a representation of our world. It has to be close enough that we understand it and how it operates and we don't need all this background on it like we would in Isekai or something. But also unique and distinct enough that we're not looking for Mitakihara City on a map. And I think this setting of Madoka Magica is a great representation of this feeling visually. Don't waste your time on world building the stuff that doesn't matter, just make it believable enough. Because that's what fantasy is, right? That's fantasy world building 101, is that, yeah, you can ask your audience to assume that an alien race of genderless um, little animals is trying to stop entropy through feelings and emotions from teenage girls, but you can't ask your viewers to assume that Junko or Madoka would have at 10 to 20 chairs of random different types just pointed towards their beds. That is to say that the setting of Madoka Magica does exactly what it sets out to do. Be believable, but still uncomfortable or awkward or weird in parts. And Shinbo's penchant for expressing that directorially matches up perfectly with this show. Another correction before we get into the episode is that Evilmon on Reddit pointed out that Bokura no is actually a very popular anime, or was at the time, and well-known in the zeitgeist, so certainly Shinbo and Urobuchi would both be familiar with the show. I've never seen it, but then again, there's plenty of people whenever I go online that haven't seen Cowboy Bebop or Kaon, and I think that's sacrilege, so... Yeah. So getting into it this episode, we're going to address the things that we held off on in the previous one. And I'm kind of sorry to say that we're going to have to jump from one thing that I'm disappointingly ignorant at being architecture, surrealism, the life and times of Shinbo, etc, etc, and then jump straight into talking about music. I think what's aggravating for me is that you can listen to a channel like 8-Bit Music Theory break down some famous ducktail space theme or what have you, and then get it down to its core constituent parts but then know that you'll never be able to think about things like that because you haven't studied uh, it in that depth. And there's really nobody doing it for something like um, the Madoka Magica OST. Also, I'll try and play a little bit over top of it in the background so you know which song I'm referring to. And if I talk on top of it, it should be fine. But then again, I thought I wouldn't get any copyright strikes on the first video either, so who knows? Credence Justitiam. It's Latin. It means believing in justice. Actually, Detour, we never talked about the fact that the show is called Puella Magi Madoka Magica. Actually, in Latin, it's more like Puella Magi Madoka Magica. 
Which to me sounds like a racist Italian caricature, but whatever Google Translate, hey bambini, puella magi, and here too referred to as uh, puella magi madoka magica, fits with the syntax of the magical girl naming structure. With the three to two syllable beats on bishojo senshi se la moon, futari wa pretty cure, maho shojo lyrical nanoha, etc., etc., etc. Of course, these all express the same concept. It's very clear in front that this is going to be a magical girl show. So in that way, the title of Puella Magi Madoka Magica is a bit subversive. One, it's in Latin. Whether or not it's poorly translated Latin, it can mean, like, the girl who is deceived by the magician instead of, um, magical girl, as I believe it's supposed to mean. But that's neither here nor there. It uses Latin, which is a dead language, and deliberately obscures the meaning. Now, it certainly doesn't, like, put it behind a lock and key. You can still fix figure out that it is Latin and then go translate it, find it means magical girl, and be like, oh, okay, it just means magical girl. Maybe they did that as a tonal thing, right? It's not like lyrical in lyrical nanoha really means anything. But in the context of knowing what we know about Madoka Magica, we can now understand that it kind of slots right into our theory about, like, being clear enough, you know, in this kind of Cube-esque mentality of, hey, I'm going to tell you most of it, but not give you the context that you would need to fully understand it, but still having enough deception that it kind of obscures what's going on and the reality of the situation. Now, of course, this is all attenuated or muddied by the fact that the words Puella Magi are never said in the show, and there is a subtitle right there in Japanese that says Maho Shoujo. Now, Japanese will often do this thing um, called furigana, and I first saw it in the Arya manga, but it's kind of a long-standing practice where the kanji can have different readings in Japanese, the onyomi and the konyomi, based on the context and how you're using that particular symbol of the kanji. However, you can even get um, creative with that and weird with it, where the kanji isn't necessarily pronounced with the same pronunciations as it would normally be in Japanese. The meaning, of course, is the same because it's this symbol and that it means one concept, like these symbols here mean magical girl, but then the interpretation or the pronunciation is different and can be different, and that's a thing that Japanese can do. So yeah, you can have these symbols which are normally pronounced maho shoujo, which mean magical girl, but they could very easily be pronounced magical girl and still have the same symbols, or they could be pronounced puella magi and still have the same kanji associated with them because they still mean the same thing. The furigana associated with it will often give you the reading if it's a weird reading like it is in Arya when they are called undines instead of gondoliers. I'm just saying I believe the title of this show to be Puella Magi Madoka Magica, not Maho Shoujo Madoka Magica. But both are definitely implied. And that's not too weird of a thing in Japanese. However, using Latin as the language certainly does and invokes a very specific style, one that's pretty close to specifically what it invokes in English. Probably the only time you've heard Latin in your Western English-speaking life is a Dori Me meme or an Orthodox Catholic priest swinging a censer back and forth. So yeah, there's a religiosity to it, there's a reverence to it, a sacrosanct nature to the language, and of course an anachronistic and archaic one too. All these things and these elements of order, these elements of precision and procession are elements that are invoked by naming the show Puella Magi Madoka Magica, but also when the whole soundtrack is named in Latin. Of course, that is an external element, and you wouldn't necessarily know that unless you looked it up. So to counteract that, let's make Mommy's theme be chanting in what sounds like Latin. I mean, very importantly, it's not Latin, it's a facsimile. But listening through the first time, I would have swore that it was Latin. Kajiura has said that she just used uh, sounds from a bunch of different languages to make up this fake language and made it sound like Italian. Now, putting aside the song's relationship to Mirai, its sister song used in the movies, that means Credence Justitam is gibberish. There are some things that kind of make sense, but not really. So that means this song works on its f facade, its mood, its feelings. It is also a choral work, which makes it feel more human. And there are multiple voices and they echo, which makes it sound like it's a group of people all singing together in support of each other. It's also got a lot of um, reverb, I guess is the word. I'm sorry if I'm misusing any musical terms, but it echoes 
so it sounds larger than it is or that it's spreading out, which is very much mirrored with the ribbons in Mommy's transformation sequence, but we'll get to that later. Of course, there's a driving rhythm and a steady beat with an electric guitar holding down a lot of the tempo. It feels to me like that element gives it a lot of its power enables it to be used as an action sequence background piece. And a flute kind of helps to gently lift and lower the melody as it goes up and down. But all of this is only feeding into the fact that front and center are those voices. The emotions of the voices, where they land, and just the feelings that their chords convey. It's especially prominent near the end of the song, where there is the breakdown um, in this, hits this weird minor key where it becomes very much an emotional kind of like, oh, tragic little bit in the action. Now, what I had ideally wanted to do here was bring on somebody who had a background in musical theory and could explain a bit more about the chord progression of Credence Just the Time. Unfortunately, everyone I know that has that kind of knowledge uh, wasn't available or didn't respond to my requests. So, as happens far too often in my life, I paid someone to pay attention to me and answer this question. Hello, clear and sweet. Thanks for your question. They confirmed that the dip I'm talking about is a key change to C minor. And the accompanying bit before the fall is a G sharp, which is a step down from the key of E into the key of C sharp minor. So there's really two parts for Mommy's theme, that rising prevailing theme that we kind of know from the intro, and the kind of minor understated bit, and how it sort of juts out against the kind of the happiness of the rest of the song. I'd also very much like to talk about how the song is uh, meaningfully changed between Mirai and Credence Just the Time. But I think we might have to actually save that one uh, for when we actually get somebody who knows what they're talking about on. I just don't have enough money for these Fiverr commissions. In lieu of that though, let's just consider how the show of Madoka Magica uses Mommy's theme. I went back and checked the four times it's used in Madoka Magica itself. That being episode one's introduction, the start of episode two, those are different and they have different edits on the song. Then of course Mommy's fight scene against Charlotte's familiars. And the great moment in episode 10 where they rescue Homer. And here's my two observations. First is that they're not afraid to edit it that they will deliberately cut it um, right on the measure or even during the middle of the key change to make it end on where they want it to end. Um, so if you're going through with the song in your mind and watching these, you can clearly see where it is cut. And the second part of that being that they deliberately use both parts of it for different things. In moments when mommy's supposed to feel heroic like this traditional magical girl, then they take out that uh, minor part of the song, the minor key change. Such a thing happens pretty egregiously at the start of episode two, being that it's Madoka's memory of what happened, and it's slightly different from what actually happened. And most of the edits are for this, or to end on the kind of a triumphant quarrel ending measure, but the really interesting one was actually in the first episode. When Mommy comes in, she comes in on the minor key. That same minor key plays out in full when she's fighting the familiars in episode three, but it reverts to the major key later on when she's talking about her emotional state. In episode 10, the show wants little to do with that type of ambiguity as it's Homer's memory, so it cuts out most of the minor key, only taking the rising swell to end on as the concept of magical girls are introduced to Homer. And I really do feel that the structure of this song matches and is important for understanding uh, Mommy's intricacies. I think a lot of Mommy's character relies on the facade that she puts up for Madoka and Sayaka. I mean, she's clearly good and just and righteous, and we can even see that here, but she loses. And Homura goes and wins. And Homura is good and just and righteous in a lot of ways, but she doesn't win either. So if the show were to very clearly associate Mommy with all things just and pure in the way of a traditional magical girl, then I think the reasons uh, why the show elicits her demise would be a little um, hard. Hard to take or hard to understand. Instead, in moments like these in Credence Just a Tam, we see enough to obviously suggest how this show is going to go and lead you down the path of Madoka and Sayaka and Mommy being, you know, a trio and having this great normal magical girl relationship, etc, etc. But also enough to hint at maybe that's not the way we should be looking at things here. Or there's just enough in her lines and how she interacts with Homura and how she's portrayed like in with this song to let us see behind the curtains. Not to say that she's a bad person at all. She's clearly not. It's just that things aren't as easy as Allies of Justice 
and people who aren't. Mami Tsumoe is fallible, as much as she makes an attempt to hide that. Her theme song reflects that. Now, we'll talk a lot more about uh, Mami's critical flaws and everything. That's most of what episode 2 and 3 are. But right now, we want to keep on moving with Mami. If we allow that her theme matches her perfectly, then we have to speak to all the other aspects of Mami that match her perfectly as well. And by that, I mean the character of Mami that is portrayed on the screen, all the aspects that lead into it, are exactly what needs to be in the role that she fills within the show. She's the senpai. She's the um, canonically good magical girl that gets killed so that we know the story is going far off the rails. Of course, she's got other nuances in depth too, but we'll go over that while we go through episodes two and three. Right now, let's just talk about the stuff we're hit with in episode one when we see her for the first time. Let's start with her name. The first part, Mommy, should be immediately obvious to anyone in the Western sphere, as it's literally an English word for mother. I think it's fairly straightforward how she plays the maternal figure to both Sayaka and Madoka. Of course, it's equally as unsubtle that she has a companion named Baby, Bebe, but that's rebellion. We're not talking about that yet. It also could reference Creamy Mommy, one of the original magical girls back from before Sailor Moon kind of codified the magical girl warrior thing. Since Madoka Magica is kind of heavily representing that type of show, or much more closer to Sailor Moon than it is to anything in Creamy Mommy. I don't know that this connection is too strong, but it's certainly possible to be there. Her last name, Tomoe has two distinct references, or three, rather. She shares this last name with another exceptionally lonely magical girl, Hotaru Tomoe. And I think there's plenty of parallels to be drawn with the relationship um, Hotaru has with Chibiusa over the course of Sailor Moon S, and the relationship that we see with Madoka and Mami over the course of uh, Madoka Magica, even if it is in fits and starts, mostly in episode three and in the flashbacks. The other reference for Tomoe is based on the kanji, which is a Shinto thing for a comma, but it's more a symbol that you'll see in some Shinto things. And the part where I see it most readily is in Mami's hairpin. The third and final one is kind of obscure and one that you wouldn't really be aware of if you were not familiar with Japanese history. Tomoe Gozen was a famous female 12th century samurai and general. Accounts say that she was exceptionally beautiful, with long hair and a very good archer. She's very much kind of a Joan of Arc figure that was really only known in Japan, but in that way, she's been the subject of many fictional representations, including uh, Chie's persona in Persona 4. How strong each of these references are, or any of the references of any of the characters' names, I'm not quite sure, but I think it's worthwhile to know. Let's move on to her character design. In multiple places, Ume Aoki stated that she came up with the idea for the weapons first, and she's even stated that Mami's design was centered around her image as a gunner. Mami, of course, uses um, single bullet flintlock rifles, and in doing this research I learned the difference between a musket and a rifle is that a rifle has the rifle boring, which you can see multiple times in the guns. She never reloads these and just spawns new ones out of hammer space. She's also very famous for having the only finishing move line or anything like that when she conjures her giant cannon and hits them with the Tiro finale. That in and of itself is meaningful that nobody else in the show does that because it's a very much established uh, magical girl warrior trope from your uh, moon tiara action all the way up to your star general uterus all the way up to your whatever Symphigear is doing nowadays with the cut-ins. It's a very, again, established trope to call your shot. So in these first two elements that we've looked at, we've already seen how she's kind of established as what we would think of as a magical girl. She's standard. We can see the various brown leather elements of her design and everything, going back to that idea of her being a gunner, um, her hat too, but in a very kind of high society, oh, let's go on a fox hunt type of way. And she moves that way too, and speaks that way too. Just a lot of poise in her performance, but also a lot of poise in how she portrays herself. Aoki states the twin tails and the hair clips uh, were meant to give her a more older sister appearance. And I definitely think giving her a large chest too contributes pretty heavily to making her feel older and wiser and more mature than the other girls. I'd also of course bring up the synergy between her twisty hair and the ribbons that she spawns. In fact, canonically, 
that's Mami's only power, right? It's shown a couple times where everything is all just ribbons. It's one of those inversions of what we expect from the genre that these nice um, traditional kind of girly ribbons are manifested as guns. In a normal magical girl series, the ribbons would still be there, but they wouldn't need to be used as guns or formed into guns. Also, the other thing is about her wish, that she was involved in a car accident when she was 13, and Kyube, as she lay dying, came to rescue her by offering her the wish to save her life. It's thought that the wish the girl makes has some effect on the powers that they gain as a magical girl. So Mommy being in a car accident, then having a prominent power to tie things up is kind of irrelevant thematically. Also, that's kind of her role in the story, right? Is to bring people together. Uh, in Rebellion, she's the leader of the Holy Quintet. She is, in every timeline, going to try and establish these bonds. Kind of summary of the, all of that, I think Mommy's a very put-together character, a very pointed and a very effective one, much like the show she's in. That all said, let's now shift gears to something else that we put off at the end of the first episode and wanted to get to at the start of the second episode, which this is already going long. I may just make this its own video, episode 1.5 or something. And that was the animation used in The Witch's Labyrinth. The surreals, landscapes, and stop-motion animation that is used throughout every Witch's Labyrinth is the product of a group called Gekidan Inu Curry. This is something really cool because it's very much outside the normal sphere um, of what anime is, but still directly related to anime. It's something kind of more like a Thunderbolt fantasy or a pop team epic in the way that it's experimental and not mainstream at all, but that's exactly why it's used in this show for those purposes. This company, Gekidan Inu Curry, is the brainchild of two people and only is those two people. There's a beautiful Sakuga blog a post about these guys, but their names are Ayumi Shiraishi and Yosuke and I. Shiraishi was going to have a promising career in traditional animation working for Gainax in the early aughts. Anaya's career was going a little less well being a digital painter and one for a studio that would close in 2007. Perhaps driven by that, uh, they decided to follow their creative ambitions, drop everything, leave the industry, and go do their own thing completely. And do their own thing they did. I mean, the stop motion, uh, cut out, paper craft style that they tend to employ is immediately discernible and immediately strange. And we could certainly talk for days about the intricacies of each bit of animation that they produce, but I do want to refocus our attention back on how this animation serves the show. Of course, it's upsetting, disturbing, and original. It cannot be confused with anything with the standard anime fare, or even in the art direction of Madoka Magica itself. It is, for all intents and purposes, entirely alien. And the novelty of using this type of animation at all is really something that aids in the shock value of it when it appears in the series. And maybe now is as good a time as any to first mention uh, Magia Record, which, along with Rebellion and the concept film, are the only other piece of animated Madoka anything that exists. Of course, in this sequel spin-off series, uh, Gekudan Inu Curry return to do all the art design for The Witch's Labyrinth. They were also put in charge of completely directing the series, so the writing, meh, but for the art direction at least, they don't miss a beat. Every interaction with the witch is just as spooky and terrifying and otherworldly as anything in the original series of Madoka Magica. There's even the silhouette uh, papercraft plays like Kyoko's backstory. But Magia Record isn't Madoka. It absolutely did not hit the same cultural notes as the first season of Madoka, nor was it anything thematically prudent, even though the art directly matches and often, very often, exceeds that of Madoka Magica. And there's a number of reasons for this, but let's start at the top of the pyramid and then work our way down to the fundamental issue. Even though the objective quality of the art taken independently is better than the original shows, it's been removed from its context and removed from its Surprise. We know how to defeat witches, we know what they appear to be, and we know what their threat level is. I suppose you could make the argument that if you were coming to Magia Record first as your first Madoka show, then yeah, it may have the same impact, but I can't believe anybody is honestly doing that. And the show is often far too enamored by the ideas of the original show to make that a realistic possibility. And it doesn't have the same effect because the stakes aren't the same. We know that Madoka's wish at the end of Madoka Magica invalidates 
dictates everything else. It is a binary. You can't increase the stakes and change the scale when the scale was the destruction of the entire universe. And this leads us to our fundamental issue, and indeed why this art only hit hard in the first series of Madoka as opposed to Magia Record. And that's because this show that we're going through right now is concise. Everything serves a purpose. Everything is slotted in to do something specifically, oftentimes multiple things. But each of these functioning cogwheels of characters and story bits um, is oiled and runs on time to plow through this inversion of the magical girl canon before arriving back at the truth of the genre. Read Madoka's Wish. Madoka Magica was not intended nor structured in a way that would facilitate an open world fresh for growing new ideas. It ends, definitively. And because it ends, because the law of the cycles has to be the thematic encapsulation of everything that the show is set out and made to do, then nothing again can be this unique. We can throw as many Inukuri, Witch, Labyrinths, and Umeaoki character designs together as much as we want, but it's never going to match the precision of this original series, nor is it ever going to have the impact that it did the first time. Art direction is much like any other aspect of a show. It is a tool, a means to an end. And if that end has already been meaningfully explored, what are we doing? Which is coincidentally exactly what I said when Mommy appeared in Magia Record. If you're interested in more along this lines, I'd recommend the book The Very Soil by Jed A. Blue. I don't really agree with everything that he says, but I think there's a lot there that is meaningful related to the other works in the Madoka franchise. So now that we've given attention to both Mommy and the Witch's Labyrinth as promised in our last episode, we can finally move forward with episode two of Madoka Magica.